Hello. Hello. Welcome. Uh, so I've got a, a newsletter sign-up sheet and some stickers and stuff if you're interested. Also, um, I just mentioned there's a farm hack tent uh, where I'm also set up doing demos in the fair area near the big tent. They've got two big cult-to-cycle home-built tractors there, which are really neat, and some other uh, DIY env environmental sensor devices and stuff, so you can go and check those out if you're interested. But this is going to be focused on FarmOS, which is the open source farm management record keeping software. So, um, yeah, let's get started. So my, uh, thanks for coming. My name is Michael Stenta. Um, I'm the lead developer of FarmOS. Uh, I gave a variation of this talk at last year's NOFA. Um, there was a lot of like really good questions and discussion, and we, we ended up going over time. It was kind of a short talk. So I tried to make my slides a little more brief this time, cut out a bunch of the, um, some of the background stuff. There's all, you know, feel free to ask questions if you have them, but we'll try to get through the slides quick and then actually look at some, and actually do some like uh, using the software live demos, assuming the internet holds out on us. Um, so, let's see. Uh, so Farmier is uh, my company. It's a FarmOS hosting service. So this is how I'm kind of supporting the continued development of this of this project. You don't need to use this. You can download FarmOS and host it yourself if you want. But if you if you'd rather just have something that you are up and running on, you can use that. So that's kind of what that is. Um, so this is a great quote from Dr. Seuss, the venerable Dr. Seuss. Um, so you know, like, what is the value of record keeping? First of all, I think with like farming, it's pretty obvious because you want to know what you grew, how much you grew it, when when you put it. You need to be able to look back and, and see when you did these things so that you can iterate on that in the future seasons, from season to season. Um, so not only like is it is it valuable in the year you're doing it, but it's valuable two, three, four years down the line because you can compare and contrast what you've done in those times, what worked, what didn't, uh, all that. Um, so the more memory you have to draw upon, the better you are at actually making decisions in the future. Um, some people have really good memories, uh, but even the best memories can change over time. My memory is not that great, and that's part of the reason why I built this myself. Is it, I like being able to um, store my memories and my information in an organized fashion, so that's kind of where some of this came from. Um, uh, so this uh, this photo behind here, I, I really like. This is a, um, just an anecdote to get us started. This is a picture from Tuckaway Farm in New Hampshire. My friend, he's actually out at the farm hack tent. Uh, it's a cardboard box that, that describes the lettuces, tomatoes, and onions in the field, uh, and the pepper varieties in the hoop house. Um, this isn't their primary record, it's just something they made in the moment to jot it down, but it already has immediate value. You know, if someone comes out to help harvest and they want to know where the jalapenos are, you just go look at the box in the in the hoop house. Um, uh, you know, you just you don't want to leave that out in the rain, obviously. So there's some drawbacks to that. Uh, this farm also uses FarmOS, so that's where these records ultimately end up is into their FarmOS system, so that they can look back on it and they don't have to worry about it rotting away. Um, but regardless of what you use, record keeping is a habit that you need to get into, um, and seeing the long-term value makes that easier. So this isn't going to be a silver bullet, you know, I'll say that right off the bat. It does take work to, to do these things, but if you see the value and you get into the habit, then that uh, will lead you a long way, I think. So FarmOS is the tool that I'm building um, to help in that process. It's a web-based application for farm management, planning, and record keeping. The main goal is to build a database that can store everything that's happened on the farm. Um, so it needs to be easy to record events. It needs to be easy to find those recorded events in the future. Uh, and that will lead to more informed decision making as you're going forward. That's sort of the basis of FarmOS. But from that, some really cool things can be built on top of it. And that's sort of where we're moving with it. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, before I, before I jump in, I, I wanted to just show a quick video. So GoDan is, stands for Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition. 
It's an initiative that was started in 2013 to support global efforts to make agricultural and na nationally relevant data available, accessible, and usable for unrestricted use worldwide. <clears throat> uh, they produced a series of videos on YouTube that feature different topics um, and initiatives around open agriculture data, and PharmOS was one of the projects they featured. Um, so I think this is a pretty good video. So this is a pedal powered tractor, human powered. The amount of horsepower that is on a normal uh, tractor is used to power the tractor itself. We grow over a hundred different crops, so a very diversified farm, and one of the motivations for creating FarmOS is to be able to manage a highly diversified operation and all the complexities associated with that. I believe every farm should be a research farm, and part of what we're doing here is uh, collecting data that can be shared. Uh, globally, even. All set. All right. Arming. Aerial imagery in general is a very fast, non-destructive way to collect a tremendous amount of environmental information about the farm, both for crops, but also from uh, forest health, water health, and other systems. It allows us to elevate our perspective, uh, quite literally. So this is just a, uh, a Raspberry Pi open source, essentially a mini computer. And it's connected to a Wi-Fi connection there and a simple USB temperature uh, probe. And it's uh, acting as both a data logger as well as communicating and logging the temperatures it records here onto uh, FarmOS. The hardware is in the range of uh, maybe less than $50. And here we have the page on FarmOS that's uh, profiling the, the sensor in, and here's the current value, so 32 degrees Celsius currently, which is within acceptable range. It's very important to, to be able to monitor the temperatures and other environmental conditions to match what uh, the current state of our crop production is and to manage the soil moisture levels, uh, humidity levels, and temperature. FarmOS is a management and record-keeping system that is based essentially on creating a website uh, that's particular to that farm. What we aim to do with FarmOS is understand a farm at its most fundamental nature so that we can look at a survey quick on the map of which sensors are currently available. Here we can see a map of the current state of where animals are on the landscape, either individual animals or in some cases flocks or, or herds or groups of animals. We also have the ability to integrate other types of data into our system, like the USDA soil survey. Here's the USDA soil survey data overlaid on our own farm. The intention is to be able to have democratized access to environmental data so that anybody has access to high quality, high resolution data at very low cost and have high participation.
This is a big collaborative effort, and I think this is indicative of the, uh, the idea of uh, open collaborative science. Uh, and that's the real fun of it when we have folks from EPA and USDA and uh, the commercial farming operation here and software developers and hardware developers all working together. So it's, it's a lot of fun. But we're also going to be piloting a project where we're co-deploying low-cost sensors with industry sa standard sensors. And that's the big focus of, of the initiative, is to develop a protocol by which we can not eliminate the need for the industry standard sensors, but use them to validate and calibrate lower cost sensors that are more accessible to more people, to more farmers. Let's get a little bit closer. We've got these cheapo soil moisture <laughs> monitors that also do temperature. And we're going to try to set this up next to fancier monitoring equipment that, uh, that they've got out there to see how they compare. So that's the, that's the plan. Okay. I have, I'm gonna make a spot for my temperature sensor. We'll fill that, we'll put that in, and then we're gonna put the soil in there until we're at 15, so that they're just kind of in there and more stable. Perfect. Okay. If you think about uh, civilization like a tree with agriculture at the roots and the population at the trunk and arts and commerce as the leaves and branches. And if people see themselves as part of that where the commerce and leaves may not weather a storm, they may break and blow, but they will regrow. But if the roots of the tree are attacked, the entire system will wither and die. And that's part of this seeing oneself as part of the agrarian system. It's very important that we all have an interest in building strong roots. And then pull up my data table, and there's my data. Yeah, so that's great. So it looks like, like everything is working really, really well. So we have uh, the sensors installed in the soil. One of our objectives was to make sure that we could get end-to-end -end communications from the sensors in the field through to FarmOS. We've, we've done it. <laughs> uh, moving that data through this uh, design will allow us to put dozens or hundreds of sensors through the same pathway. So that's very, very exciting. I think a big part of agriculture is creating a record that's publicly accessible so future generations don't have to duplicate uh, the, the work of generations past. And it's clearly in our global interest for every farmer to improve the land beneath their feet. Uh, so that, that's a pretty fun project. I'm going to be going up um, at the end of this month again to kind of continue with that uh, sensor deployment. We did sort of the um, proof of concept of that and got it up and running. So now I'm going to go up and we're going to try to get more of that data coming from the Campbell data logger into FarmOS so that we've got that stream. Because right now the, the soil scientists who are working with that have to go up to Wolf's Neck and get the data directly from the data logger. But if we can get it into FarmOS, they can look at it from anywhere, uh, anywhere over the internet. Um, so yeah, I'll just try to cover some of these things really quick so that we can get to some real demos. Um, so some of the big picture goals of FarmOS, manage everything. We wanna be able to map fields, greenhouses, buildings, you know, map, map out your, your farm. Tracking things like plantings, animals, equipment, um, recording, logs of activities, inputs, harvests, um, organizing your documents, soil tests, medical records for your animals, um, collecting data from environmental sensors, which we kind of showed there, and then also, you know, being able to build add-ons for other, for other features, uh, like for beekeeping I mentioned, and compost, maple, mushrooms, those are all modules that are already available to plug into FarmOS to extend it. Uh, and the goal is to be able to work at any scale, so small, diversified operations, 
uh, where there's a lot of different crops, you know, where you have to manage multiple plantings of multiple crops. Permaculture homestead is probably even more detailed to, than that because it's not, it's often not on a grid system at all. It's all over the place. Um, uh, big industrial farms, which is actually, you know, simpler in some ways, harder in others for record keeping. Um, and then, you know, everything in between, urban and indoor, uh, micro grows, uh, aquaponics. Uh, the goal is to create a platform that's open source that, that people can build upon to, to make more. Um, and from anywhere. So it's a, it's a web-based system. Uh, it lives on a web server and you can access it on any device with a web browser. Uh, the, so the, the goal, the reason that it's open source is so that we can build a global community around it. Um, anyone can contribute to the development of this project. The code is freely available. I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, language translations and unit conversions so that it can be used worldwide. Uh, and to serve as a platform for farmers, researchers, service providers, anyone who needs access to that data. Um, and then add-on modules for specific features. So I, I was just, uh, I just wrapped up a project with the University of Vermont to build a food safety module to provide the record keeping for the Food Safety and Modernization Act, um, which is gonna be a requirement for a lot of, a lot of farms. Um, so that's just an example of an add-on. And data ownership is an important piece to this. So data has a lot of value, and in a lot of the software systems that are out there now, you don't own that data. You're signing it over to whatever company that you are, that is uh, doing it. So at FarmOS, you're in control of that. You can share it if you want to. In the video, you know, we talked about making information public and stuff. That's, that is a possibility, but not a requirement. So you, you can share what, the goal is to be able to share what you want to share if you want to share it to contribute to this, this larger knowledge base. So, um, PharmaOS is free and open source. What does that mean? Um, who here is familiar with open source or has come across it before? Great, that's awesome. I'm always surprised. There's a lot, a lot of people are familiar with it. Um, so, you know, this is one of the things that sets PharmaOS apart from other uh, software that's out there. Um, all of the code is freely available. Uh, anyone can install it and host it themselves. Um, I mentioned that I have a Farmier hosting service, but you don't need to use that. You can set it up yourself on your own server and host it. Um, uh, and anyone can contribute to the project by adding features, fixing bugs, writing documentation, or just helping out others in the FarmOS chat room. Um, so alongside the development of the software itself, we're also trying to build a community of people who are involved with, with this software. Um, so just some examples of, uh, of some open source you've probably dealt with, Android, uh, Mozilla, Wikipedia, these are all sort of things built on open source. Um, so then in addition to being open source, this is sort of an important point, Pharmos is also free software. And what this means is that you, you are free to do what you want with the code. There aren't restrictions. So some things could be open source, but you're still limited in what you're allowed to do by the license of the code. Um, this, you can, you can download it, you can modify it, you can redistribute it. Uh, here's sort of the definition of what free software is officially. So it's the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose, the freedom to study how the program works and change it so it does your computing as you wish. Uh, access to the source code is a precondition for this. So that's where the open source part is sort of a subset of, of the free software. Um, freedom to redistribute copies so you can help your neighbor and the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions. Um, by doing this, you can give the whole community a chance to benefit from your changes. So this is the same thing that is you know, being used in the hardware world too, with the, um, the tractors that are out in the tent right now, the cultocycles, and some of the stuff that you saw in that video. Uh, so this, this is Richard Stallman. He kind of was the founder of the Free Software Foundation. So he described open source as a development methodology. It's sort of a way of developing free software is more of a social movement. Uh, a good, I think a good point about open source is that its development is cumulative. Um, so you're, everyone's sharing the code, so you can kind of build on all these things that came before. You're not reinventing the wheel over and over and over. And like, we, like I showed you, a lot of the software that we use today is relying on so many open source libraries already. So you're standing on the shoulders of giants. When a problem is solved, everyone gets the solution. And when improvements are made, everyone benefits. So that naturally kind of um, 
evolved into open source hardware. Open source sort of started in the software world. I mean, the idea is bigger than that, but it then sort of, um, the, the phrase open source moved into the hardware world, and that's where sort of FarmHack came out of. So that's the tent that's set up right now. So FarmHack is an open source community for resilient agriculture. You can go to farmhack.org to um, view lots of different plans uh, for tools. Um, there's some software on there too. There's uh, sensors you can build yourself. Um, the Culta Cycle is there, which is the pedal power tractor. Uh, livestock weigh scales. Um, there's a root washer. Uh, you can also, um, if you build something yourself, you can document that on FarmHack and share it. And other people can kind of take that, build it themselves, iterate on it, document those iterations, and it can just c continue the improvement. Um, so let's get to FarmOS. So the current version, which I just released this past week, is 1.0 beta 14. Doesn't really mean that much, it's, it just means it's the 14th beta release, so it's still in beta. Um, that doesn't really mean too much, it's sort of arbitrary. People are using it now, it is, it is stable. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of working towards an official 1.0 release, so that's, that's all that means. Um, but one, one thing to, that, I, that I'll note is that there's sort of, the, the roadmap is long term. So in this 1.x branch, which is 1.0, 1.1, 1 1.2, we're laying the groundwork having mapping of areas, tracking of assets in their history, sensor integration, those are kind of the main goals. And then we're gonna be getting into more of the bookkeeping with sales purchases, um, et cetera, inventory management, uh, reporting and analysis around all these things, um, and life cycles and you know things turning into other things. So um, right now we're still kind of in the groundwork phase on a lot of this. You can use it for a lot of the record keeping and uh, as these new features are added on, it'll just keep expanding the, the capabilities of the system. But that's where it is now. So you'll see kind of some of these demos. I might actually, I might just flip through these really quick so that we can actually look at some real demos. I did, I put together these brief screencasts just to, in case we didn't have internet or something like that, I didn't wanna send you all home. Um, so there's the, this is basically the farm dashboard. You've got your map on the left that has all of the areas that you've mapped. Uh, you can import areas from KML files. Um, I'll show that in a second. Uh, and then you can zoom in and click on different areas. So you can click on a bed, for example, and it'll say, that's the bed, there's the square footage, there are six plantings there. You can click on that to view the list of plantings in that bed. Um, on the right is sort of your plan. There's nothing in this one right now, but if you have tasks that are you know, on your to-do list, they'll show up here. Uh, basically, there, I'll, I'll kind of go into this a little more detail, but in FarmOS there's, uh, this is a good point here, so areas, the main menu is areas, which is your mapped areas, assets, which are the things you own, like plantings are an asset, they're in the field, you own them, they have value. Animals are an asset. Equipment are assets. These are the things that you're dealing with. So is the bed within the area also an area? It is, yes. Yep. Um, and then you have logs. Logs are the events. They're the records of things with a specific date and time, and they relate to the areas and assets. So for example, if you have a seeding, uh, you would have a planting, and then you would create a seeding log of that planting, or a harvest log of that planting. Um, with animals, you can have movement logs of the animals. Um, uh, equipment can have maintenance logs, uh, that kind of thing. And then they don't need to be linked to anything either, though. It could, you could just have an activity log that says, I went out and uh, you know, plowed the field or something. It doesn't have to be related. But the, the ability to relate all these different things together is sort of what, what one of the main strengths of FarmOS is. So that, you can get to things from various ways. So like, like on here, you can go in on the map, you can click on it, you can get to your plantings that way, or you can go up to the assets menu and get to plantings that way. Or if you know you're looking for a harvest log, you can go to logs, harvests, and that'll show you the planting that way. So it gives you a lot of different angles to get to the same information. Again, getting back to being able to record things easily and being able to find things easily. That's sort of the goal. So this works on a phone. Um, you can load it up just like you would a normal website. You don't need to download an app or anything. Uh, it's mobile friendly. Um, one of the log types that I use a lot is the observation log. So you can just go out 
start an observation log, take a picture with your phone, it gets, it gets attached to that, you can record information and then and link it to a bed or to a planting or something. So if you see you have pests or something, you can create an observation log for that. Um, we'll show some of those more thing, some of those things more too. Mapping of areas. So you've got different types of areas, like your fields, buildings, paddocks, etc. Uh, you can draw points, lines if you're doing like a fence line or something, polygons for your areas like fields and buildings. They're color coded, and you can get your estimated acres uh, or square footage. Um, this, this demo is actually a little bit outdated. It's basically the same, but um, I think the new version looks a little bit better. But you'll see. So this is just sort of what it's, what it's like to draw out your, your areas. So you just kind of draw it out and save it, and then it gets it's added to your map with the, with the other shapes. Um, areas can be hierarchically related, so you can have your field and then your beds within the field, or you know, your property and your fields within the property. You can, you can decide how you conceptually want to think about your farm and, and the areas there. Uh, this is just the KML import. Um, so KML files you can get from, if, you have, if you've already mapped your farm, for example, in Google Earth or Google Maps or something, oftentimes you can export a KML file from that and then import it into FarmOS so that you don't have to redraw stuff if you've already gone through this process. So right here it's just uploading a KML file, pulling it in, there it is. Uh, this I, I just included as an interesting example. So this, this is a person in, in uh, Norway who's using FarmOS. Uh, they have a tractor that they went out, they did a spraying of their field. They went out and um, just had a handheld GPS device with them at the time. Um, that recorded and created a KML file for them, which they then imported into FarmOS. So they have their, their, um, their log of this event with like a precise movement of where they actually did this. So I thought that was a cool use case. So this is a feature that I, I made um, on top of some of the, the area management. This is just like a, a tool that, that makes it easier to auto-generate things. So for example, beds, it's a pain in the butt to draw. If you've got a lot of beds, to draw each one there. So what this will do is you select your area. You say, I want to create beds. You say there's 40 beds. And then you like tweak the orientation of them so that you get it right and click generate and then you've got all your beds there and you can click on one it will say what the square footage is and then you can start linking linking records directly to each bed like that what we're working on um, as part of a uh, one of the next pieces is uh, the ability to sort of archive beds so that you know, if your beds change, or you totally, if you decide, ah, this orientation isn't working, and next year you draw, you do them all that way, you still want to have records of the of where they were before. Um, so that's kind of in the works right now to be able to archive those. Um, so I kind of touched on this before. Assets are the other sort of type of record in FarmOS. They represent things, plantings, animals, equipment compost piles, be, uh, beehives, um, mushroom substrates, uh, maple um, groves, these are all assets in FarmOS. Blue. Uh, so this just shows like a full list of assets. I'll go, it'll be easier to show some real demos I think than to see this part. But you can see that it breaks it down into your different asset types in the main menu there so you can kind of separate things. Um, and you can see a map, specifically not just of areas, but of where your assets are. So you can see my plantings are, are right here. So click on that. And it says those are those where the onions are and beans. And then you can get to those records through the map like that. Uh, a lot of what, what I'll do often is take a picture of the seed packet with my plantings. But then you can have your observation logs, your seeding logs, all you know, all the different things you want to record around this planting. So there's my weedy <laughs> popcorn patch. But you get the idea. It's 
So then, yeah, logs. Logs are the events. So this is the other type of record. The three types of records, again, are areas, assets, and logs. Logs are what link everything together. Logs are what have a specific timestamp associated with them. A specific, they happen at a specific time. Um, so they're your record of all the events. There's different types of logs. So you can have an activity log, observations, movements. Actually, so this is an update to scratch that one. Movements is actually incorporated into the other logs now too, but I won't get too off topic there. You can do movement logs, um, inputs and harvests. And then for specific asset types, you can have more specific logs. So for plantings, you also can have seeding logs and transplanting logs. For animals, you can have medical logs. Um, for equipment, you can have maintenance logs um, and that, that kind of thing. So here's just sort of a list of logs. Um, this is like the full list of all your logs, but generally you'll probably go to the <coughs> logs menu and pick the type that you want. So let's look at harvests. So then you can, you can see all the harvests that you've done, the, the plantings that they came from. You can take a picture with it. You can say how many pounds you, you know, quantity associated with that. Similarly, for inputs, you can have uh, your various inputs, what they went into, how much you did, more notes associated with each one, how it was uh, applied, um, what the purpose was. A lot of this is, is to meet the needs for organic certification records. So if you're um, you know, putting all this stuff into FarmOS, you can then share that with your certifying agent so that they can log in from afar if they need to. Uh, here's just an example of kind of a use case. So equipment, uh, I use this a lot. So what I'll do is attach owner's manuals to the equipment records. So I've got a rototiller and I've got like the parts list and the owner's manual uh, attached to it in FarmOS so that if I'm working on it, I can just load that up on my phone through FarmOS um, and keep track of maintenance logs uh, and also remember where you left it through movement log. So this is just uh, equipment. There's the record for the tiller. So you can take some pictures of it. I like to also take pictures of like the serial numbers and, and engine, uh, uh, you know, all the labels on it. You can record your activities. Uh, it's up to you how granular you want to get with it. You know, the FarmOS is really, it's really, uh, it's meant to be a database for, for all kinds of things. Uh, if you want to be really granular about your records, you can do that. Um, if you don't need to do that, you don't need to do that. Uh, it's up to you. Uh, one, one key thing, so logs can be done or not done. So you can see like there's checks next to these ones that are done or not done. So for example, I said I want to change the oil on September 1st. Uh, I just checked that and said done. So now that's marked as done. That's just a way of, of managing your to-do list so that you know whether or not you've done something, essentially. Um, feel free to ask questions, too, if I'm going too fast, or if I'm trying to get through some of this so that we can get to some real demos, because I think that'll be more valuable. Um, so location of everything is determined by logs also. So whenever, whenever you want to say that something is somewhere, you create a log that says it is there. So you can have an observation that says, uh, you know, the cattle busted out of their paddock. They're over here now, if you want that granularity. Could you tie it into a sensor? Yeah, so that's, yeah, we actually, um, someone in the farm hack community is working on uh, collars that can triangulate cattle and then send that information. So we haven't, we haven't, he hasn't fully completed that yet, but yeah, that's on the, on the horizon. And you know, these kind of things are available in the commercial world already, so this is like, building it from the ground up again as open source. Um, and then you can have activity movements. So you can say, like here's an example, I want to move the cattle that are in Middle Bay. So you click on Middle Bay, click on animals. This shows you the animals that are in Middle Bay. Select all, click move. Um, sorry if this is a little fast. But basically just say where you want to move them to. It auto automatically fills in where they were. 
When you do that, will the cows start moving to the <laughs> Yeah, but we're working on that. <laughs> Yeah, but it's funny you mentioned that though because the guy who's working on the collars was also talking about uh, putting a little speaker in them so that you could actually like get on the microphone and you know actually train train them to to respond to commands and stuff. So yeah, possibly. I mean, if you could if you could connect those dots when the movement log is created, it automatically sends a voice command to them. There you go. <laughs> Uh, so soil tests, uh, you know, this is another useful element. If you, if you get soil tests done frequently, um, you probably have them in random emails somewhere or like in a piece of paper that's lost somewhere. Uh, I know I have lots of those. You can put them in Formal S so that they're all kind of in the same place. So here's an example. We're going down to the soil tests log, log list. So these are all soil tests from this place. Um, they're all dated as to when they were done. You can actually say, here are the sample points that I took these from. Um, there. Uh, and then you can say, you know, what lab did you send it to to have it done? And then you can, you can attach a PDF uh, that they send back. Can you um, store the actual values so you can search them later? Yeah, so we're working on that actually. I'm, I'm working with the um, the Cornell Soil Health Lab uh, to, and another project with um, the Vermont NRCS to do exactly that. The main thing right now is it's a, it's a lot of data entry to, you know, you would have to manually copy each one individually. So what we're actually trying to think through and, and build is the ability for the soil lab itself to transmit that data to your farm OS automatically. So it fills in all the things there for you. Um, could read the PDF. That's hard. Yeah, I mean that was one thing we were thinking about though too. It's just that every lab has a different format. They all are. I mean, some some a lot of the same data points, but some have other data points or some have different values. Um, so it's definitely possible, but I think that would be the hard route to take. Uh, the other thing I, I think it showed this a second ago. Um, but when you go and add a soil test, you can actually load the um, NRCS soil survey layer on top and see where, where the lines go through your property. Uh, I think it'll demo this again. But then you can click a button and it'll actually load up what, those, what soil types are, are in, at, in the points that you selected, essentially. So um, you can record that along with your soil test. So for example, The layers button is over here, so you would click on that to view different layers that are available for your farm. So see NRCS soil survey layer, turn that on, and then it kind of pulls that data in from, from the NRCS's service. Um, then you can go in and draw your points. So this is where I took little samples from. And then you come down here and say look up soil names. It'll load that also. So it says Canton and Charlton soils, 8 to 15% slopes, very stony. It's, that can be useful information. Uh, so another, another big focus of Formal S is sensor integration. Um, so I've got a bunch of little Raspberry Pi computers around my place that are doing temperature and humidity. Uh, um, my friend, uh, so we also were doing um, soil moisture sensors. Uh, so basically, we're, we're trying to build a framework to be able to receive data, link it to your assets, link it to your areas, so that you can start to gather that kind of information, and to have you know basic alerts set up so that if it goes above a certain temperature in a greenhouse, it'll send you a, a text or an email so that you can remember to go and open the doors. Or uh, another use case that I saw was setting it up in your root cellar so that it alerts you if it's about to get too cold or something like that. To, getting to freezing. Uh, so that's, you know, that a lot of this stuff is in process. We're, we're using it, um, but it doesn't do graphing yet. That's a pretty simple thing to add. I just haven't gotten around to it. So that's on the list. Um, but, but it can collect the data. So once we get the graphing, you'll be able to see all that too. 
And then data analysis, uh, more advanced ways to slice and dice that information. Um, so here's an example of a root cellar. Uh, so two sensors here, one temperature, one humidity. Sensors are a type of asset too. So you can move them around. You can have other logs associated with them. And scrolling down, we'll show you the sensor data with the timestamp. So you'll see it was 21 degrees Celsius at uh, August 13th. Does anybody use it for automation? Yeah, so we, we have we've been playing around with that a little bit. Um, it uh, no one's no one's using it that I'm that I'm aware of to uh, to do fully automation stuff. But yeah, that's sort of on the horizon as a next step. Um, so yeah, another thing I kind of touched on is people and roles. So everyone can have a login. You can if you've got multiple people working on the farm, they can each have a login. You can actually assign tasks to people and have have them you know, responsible for those tasks. There's different levels of permissions. So there's three different roles. There's a farm manager, which has full access to everything. Farm worker has most access, but it's a little more limited. And then farm viewer is only read. So you can only look at stuff. You can't actually make changes or add logs or anything. So the use case for that is like a certifying agent or someone who's who just needs to see your farm but doesn't isn't actually taking active an active role. So this just shows you go up to people, you can add a person, and all that. Uh, FarmOS is actually built on another open source system called Drupal. So a lot of this stuff is just um, stuff that comes out of the box from that system. So we're leveraging a lot of that and then building this farm specific record keeping stuff on top. So if you want more information, you can go to farmos.org. There's bunch of documentation. I did a load more documentation leading up to this talk too. Uh, there's links for the downloads and the source code. The issue queues are where you'd go for uh, feature requests or to see the roadmaps or bug reports. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm curious about the farms yield the records and whether or not there's any integration with scales and um, you know, like the stuff that would be by hand? Uh, so you're talking about meat? Uh, or, or, or no, um, yeah, vegetables, okay. Right. I mean, meat would be the same thing. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, so um, so there are harvest logs, and we can, sh we can take a look at this in a second. Um, and that has a quantity field on it, so you, you can record the weight of your harvests. So yeah, it is manual data entry uh, at the moment, but it wouldn't be too, you know, it's not um, hard to imagine just taking that next step of automating that uh, so that you put it on the scale, um, and then it, it links it back to the planting that's associated with it. One of the recent features that I just built is CSV imports. So you could theoretically, you know, one, a lot of it is about workflow and, and developing a workflow to get the data in here. Because data entry is always going to be the, the biggest hurdle, I think. And that's what I talk, that's where I try to talk about, like, getting in the habit of things. It's also about developing a good workflow, I think. So, like, one example could be you have a clipboard next to your scale. You, record, you just write it down, what, what you're doing as you're going, and then every once in a while, or at the end of the year even, over the winter, you put that in a spreadsheet and import it into, into FarmOS. So then it's archived there. Um, unless you need it during the season in FarmOS, then you can do it more frequently. Well, then I get to my second question, which is how do you get, this, how do you get the data back to do analysis? Yeah, so there's a, just like there's a CSV import, you can do a CSV export. So you can load up your list of harvests, you can filter it down to a certain crop or a certain area or a certain um, planting, and then you can export that and do whatever you want with it. Yep. Has anybody ever used it for uh, historical grazing plans, stuff like that? Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, for like, planning your movements of cattle through yeah. a grazing plan. That's exactly what the movement logs were sort of designed around. Um, the guy who did the who did the collars that I was talking about, um, uh, he, he sort of contributed some of those ideas to, to build out this movement log idea. So I'm curious, because I don't, I don't always use exactly the same fence line. There's a lot of portable fencing. Yeah, OK, um, great question. So yeah. um, looks like I'd have to re-enter the 
spot to yeah. create new areas for every So this came center. this came up um, a year or two ago, the idea of temporary fencing yeah. and temporary areas, meaning like you have, um, you draw your areas out, but if you're moving your chickens around or beef in, a, in like the lightweight fencing, you're not gonna draw every one of those on the map. So yeah, what you can actually do with that is um, the movement logs can have their own geometry on it specifically too. So it might be easier to just show that, but you can you can reference the larger area that it's in, but then actually draw specifically where you move them to, Great. specifically with that movement log. So it's it's maybe linked to a larger area that's a permanent area, and it's within that, but it's a more specific fence line drawn just for that one movement kind of thing. That's how we handle it. Um, yeah, there's also more stuff on there. You can check it out. Uh, and join the community. So first up, use FarmOS. We need, we need more people beta testing it and just trying it out and coming up with ideas. And uh, Feature requests are great. Bug reports are always welcome. <laughs> um, planning and general discussion. We have a monthly call. Uh, it's on the, I think, second Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. via Google Hangout. So that's usually really fun. We just kind of brainstorm ideas. Uh, last one was uh, this week, actually. Um, so it'll be four weeks from now. Is that so nobody joins because it's during the day? Oh, yeah. And, well, so we, we played around with different with different things. We're always open to change in the, I know, I know. I think I think we did that actually over the winter, and it just kind of stuck for, for now. But yeah, it, I definitely see the number of people on the calls drop off in the summertime. So sponsoring development, that's that, you know, example of that is UVM sponsored the development of the food safety module. So that's that's always a great way to, to help out if you you know aren't doing it yourself. Documentation, we need more always. Um, and then if you're a developer, you know, get involved, contribute some patches, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. What do you guys use for version control? Git. Yep. Are you on like a publicly accessible repo? Yep. So we're on GitHub and also Drupal.org, because um, Drupal.org just provides a little bit more of the Drupal-specific record or uh, issue management. Uh, but we also use GitHub. Yep. Uh, so then I'll, I'll just end it with this other quote. Hopefully, this kind of this session in general will get you a little motivated, but it's up to you to get in the habit uh, in general. Uh, so yeah, do you wanna? Are there other questions? Should we should we um, should we set up a farm together? Should we just jump in and do that? Okay. We got a question about hosting. Yeah. Um, if you have your own website, yep. Um, is it possible to host it on there? It is. Yep. Yep. Um, there's some requirements. You know, you need PHP, uh, but most hosts have those capabilities. Uh, so you can actually. I'll just open up. Um, So if you go to farmos.org, zoom out a bit here. Under there's a hosting tab, so you can see getting started. This will tell you if you want to do it yourself or if you want to do subscription hosting. You can go either route. Um, but then yeah, it'll show you how to install, what the requirements are. There are some requirements that most hosts might not have, but not for you know key features. That area generator, for example, used a um, sort of a more specialized geometry library that most hosts don't have. So the area generator might not work, but um, most of the other things are included. And then if you're hosting it yourself too, you'll also want to familiarize with like how to update when new versions come out and that kind of thing. So these are the types of things you get for free if you do it through the subscription. You'll get automatic updates and that kind of backups and stuff like that. The hosting is, is very reasonable. What? Your hosting is very Oh, did you look at it? I, I signed up. Oh, awesome. Oh, cool. Great. Uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, beta pricing right now, so it's only fifty dollars a year. That'll that'll be that'll be the case um, even after the beta period is over for anyone who's any of the early early adopters. Um, so that would be uh, on that website. Yeah. What's that? Fifty dollars a year would be on that particular website. Uh, you would get your own. So here, I'll show you. Um, Let's see, Nofa. I just set this up before the. This is so you would get a something .farmos .net site, and then you'd have your farmos in that. Um, so.
So I just set this up before the, before the thing, and I just typed in Hampshire College as the location to get us started. So here we are. So the first thing we'll probably want to do, let me um, just get us some more room here. Hide the bookmarks. Might be tempted to set up barriers on your like iPad or iPhone. Use your computer. Yeah. It is a little bit easier still on the computer. You can do it. I've done it, but it is easier on the computer. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, you know, I think, and here I'll demonstrate that a little bit too. So it's it's uh, you know intended to scale down so that you can get it to work on a small device. It's all mobile uh, responsive. Um, but yeah, you know, some things are just easier to do on a bigger screen. So you, you decide what works, what doesn't. Yep. So this might be a little basic question, so sure. I apologize. No. Um, so it's only through the internet that can do this, right? That is true, and that's a, that is a, an important point, that if you have limited internet access, this might not work for you, unless you, you know, take your records on your notepad in the field and then Transfer. translate them later. Is there any, um, like thought in the future of having like a kind of app that I could like get the data but not necessarily like all the features and then load it? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're currently working on, well I'm not working on, but a guy who knows how to make mobile apps decided that he was interested in setting up a, a PharmOS mobile app. So it's still in the scoping and planning phase. If, if you're interested in following along, this is the, this is the discussion about that. Um, the, I think the main, the first step is going to be basically an observation app, so you can um, take observations and also record harvests. So it's going to be a much simplified version because um, it won't have access to the full database if you don't have an internet connection. But the idea is you'll be able to save stuff temporarily to your phone and then it'll automatically sync back to your, when you have an internet connection to your database. And, and to follow up on that, yep. so my question earlier, your answer to that, um, if you're doing something that will create a CSV file on your phone, you could that yeah, good. exactly, yep. So here, I'll just show that real quick. So if we go to logs and say harvests here, there's nothing in here right now, but here's the import harvests button. Oops, uh-oh, bug. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna um, cheat and log in as the admin. Live demos are always a risk. <laughs> um, oops. Let's just take a second. Um, Okay, where was I? Harvests. So that's a bug I'll have to fix after this. It, uh, the imports was a brand new feature that I just put out in this latest release, so I guess I forgot to text, test the access to it. Um, that should be pretty simple. Uh, so here's the harvest importer. So yeah, you can download a template CSV file. Um, I'll just save it to my desktop and open that up to show you what that looks like. So yeah, you could download the CSV template, put that on your phone maybe, um, and then record into that if you have an app on your phone that can do CSVs. Does that, is that what you were thinking? That's what I was asking. Yeah, okay, that should work. Um, so yeah. So you got your date, uh, name of the harvest if you want, um, the things that they're linked to, areas that they're in, notes, categories, and then your quantity value and unit is where you'd put the harvest. So, so CSV is just like an Excel sheet in an open source program? Yeah, maybe I should have said that before, yeah. So spreadsheets um, can be saved as a .csv file. And that's a very standardized format that can be opened by any spreadsheet application and can be read by software very easily. So it's just a type of file you can save it as. Yep. Including apples, CSVs? What's that? Including apples, CSVs? Because sometimes... I mean, there's sometimes you do run into issues with like um, Windows and Mac and Linux all working slightly different in terms of how they, they export. But most of the time that can be resolved either through the way that you go to the file save as or in... But importing your template, it'll... 
Yeah, yeah if you then, use that template, it should work. I think so, yeah, okay. yep. Okay. If not, file a bug report. I'll, I'll fix it. <laughs> Um, cause that, yeah, like I, you know, I test as much as I can, but that's what uh, I need help with also. Uh, so yeah, let's jump back to, oops. Okay. So, uh, I'll just, um, so I noticed they've got a farm over here. Um, so let's add an area to that. So let's see, I'll say field, field A. So basically when you're adding things, you just have a form and it's broken down into different sections so you can get, you, you know, you, you can keep it as simple as you want. General information for an area will be just the name and the area type. So we'll say this is a field. Area type right now mainly just is what, how it gets color coded in the map. So fields are yellow. Um, and then you, you can draw the geometry. So let's see. It starts you off with where your other other stuff is. Let's go over here and we'll just draw this right here. So you click on this polygon button and just click at every every point where you need to create it and then double click to finish. What this will actually do is generate a um, uh, code down at the bottom. It's basically just, it says, this is a polygon it's made up of points with these latitude and longitude. So that's all it is. You can give it a description if you want to. I'm not going to now. And then you save it. And now my farm includes two areas. It includes field A, which it'll then show you the uh, um, calculated area. Uh, this, is a, this is a minor bug here, but that's OK. <laughs> um, and then the, I also still have the Hampshire College as an area. Because I, I only did that so that we could get here quickly, I'm actually going to go and delete that area now. So I'll click on areas up here and scroll down. So here's my list of areas. I'll just delete Hampshire College for now. So you go to edit, and then all the way down to the bottom, delete. So now if we go back to our dashboard, that is the only thing that it's, so it'll auto zoom to where your areas are basically. So I'll just add a couple more real quick. Um, and feel free to call out if you want to see anything specific or have any ideas. Well, I'll show you the soil survey if you're interested. So you just click on this here and it'll sort of fill in with these. It's kind of only marginally useful when you're looking at a, this kind of area map. It's more useful when you've got the soil test because that's where the button is to load up what the actual types are. Um, so we've got a feature request to be able to click on these to get more information. But you can also you can also look up these specific codes if you Google like soil type and then the code it'll it'll tell you that. Where is that information coming from? This is coming from the NRCS Soil Survey API, so it's connecting to their server and pulling in this map layer to display over it. Is that throughout anywhere, or do they? You, you can access that. Yep. Yeah, it's really helpful actually. It's really a useful service. They have their own service you can go to on their website too, but then they also provide these APIs so that your programs can connect to it and pull in this information. But, but beware because they're not always right. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yep. I'm I'm fascinated by the soil survey. Like but is how that do they extracted from the really, really old ones? Like I think have an old book it depends, from the 50s yeah, it depends on where you are. Yeah, I think they get updated but probably not very often. It's also just the scale. I mean like like this field right here is probably on a small scale for the soil. Yeah. Like that line may not be exactly right. I know. I'm fascinated though by like, how did they know? You know. I mean, I'm not a soil scientist, so it's a mystery to me. But I think oh it's I think it's amazing. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. You, you go <laughs> yep. Gets a little less useful the farther you go out, but. Wow. Um, oh, man. Uh, it's not a human labor to gather all these samples. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. Season. Yeah, I don't trust that it could possibly be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it's a lot of yeah. better than nothing, though. You know. Yeah. So I'll just draw a couple more areas. So could be one more. Yeah, 
often they update the uh, Google aerials? I don't. I think that depends on area too. I've noticed. Yeah, I've noticed at my place it was like it didn't change for years and years and years, and then like three years in a row it changed. So I think it depends. You can check the other ones too because they update at different time intervals. Also, just put in a greenhouse here just to. Okay, so now, um, so now we've got some fields. Uh, just to keep it simple, I'm not going to go down to the bed level. I'm, um, what is there? We got half an hour left. Is that right? Two thirty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can we can put in an animal record. That's an easy one. So I'm going to add an animal. I'll say this is Steve, the cow. <laughs> um, can you herds as opposed to like individuals? Um, that's on, that's one of the next features I'm, I'm going to be working on. We talked about it on the last call, actually. Yeah, so um, right now, individual animals is how this works. But some people are using the individual animal records for things like flocks. Because um, I, I think uh, poultry is one of the main use cases for having groups. So what we're going to be doing, actually, is creating under assets. You'll have plantings, animals, equipment, and then groups. Groups will be able to be use just like any other asset, but they represent you know, multiple things. And then if you have individual animal records, you could actually put them into that, that group too. So that's, that's what we're gonna do. But for now, if you, if you wanna keep using it, you could, you could just create animal records for the group. Right, right. Now there are, there is a group though, this is gonna change, but there is a way to just say that this, is, this animal is part of this group. Um, so that what this is more this is more for like a tagging it and categorizing it and saying like this is the bread heifers or this is the um, uh, you know chicken flock one or something like that um, this animal is in uh, so that's going to evolve into more of a full fledged asset type in itself so I'll just say cow for this uh, we'll say it was born a while ago um, uh, male or female. So you get the idea. Oh, uh, but then I'll say location is field A. Um, and then, so in this, you can also do like a description. You can have ID tags. So if you have an ear tag or a tattoo or something and what the ID is, where it is, you can have multiple of those. Um, you can also have nicknames. You can also track lineage. So if you have the parent cows in there, you can add them as parents here, so you can go up and down the chain of, of animals. The same actually is true of other asset types too, so you can have, if you collect your own seeds, you can have a planting that has a previous parent planting that it came from. Uh, and then file attachments, so this is where you could upload photos or uh, breed documents or something like that, um, it's pretty free form. Assets are active or inactive. So when, when you're no longer, after you've harvested your planting or after you know, um, the cow has gone to the slaughterhouse, you can mark it as inactive. It'll still be archived, it just won't show in your main lists anymore. So that's how you can kind of keep things organized during the year. Um, so now we've got Steve the cow. So notice this says asset saved, Steve the cow. Also, log created, current location, field A. So this is just sort of a, a background thing that happened when I put in that location. It automatically created a log for Steve that said they are in field A. So like I said, movements always revolve around logs. They always have a specific time that that happened. So it has, I think, is that today's date associated with it? Yes. Log? Yep. If I had back data that I wanted yeah. to get into like with my crop rotation, Say, yep. Can I adjust that date? Yeah. So let's uh, yeah, let's take a look at plantings now because I think that'll be the. Uh, oops. I think this will demonstrate that too. So um, with animals, that's a little bit tricky right now because there isn't a date field on that location thing. But you could go, you could create the animals and then create the locations afterwards. It's just kind of two steps. With the plantings, though, when you're creating a planting, so I can say like um, 2017. Uh, uh, someone name out name a crop. Carrots. Carrots. Uh, and what's the variety? Nelson. Nelson. Yeah, Nelson. Nelson. Okay. Nelson. 
else. Um, so I'll say 2017 Nelson carrots. Uh, naming conventions, I would recommend getting into a habit of doing like year first, and then, and then the maybe maybe 2017 carrots Nelson would be better. Then the only reason for that is that the lists by default are alphabetical, so it just makes it easier to find what you're looking for if you name it in that way. There is a, a way to sort and filter the lists too. It's just the the default right now is alphabetical. You can give it a season if you want. Um, that's just for organization. I'm not going to do that right now. But then, um, similar to the like location field set that I showed you before, this would give you the ability to do current location. With plantings, you can also say, this is my seeding date, or this is my transplanting date. And this will create a seeding log or a transplanting log uh, for those plantings. So I'll show that. I, I may have missed this, but is there the potential for doing analysis inside this map right now? Not, not really like um, uh, advanced reporting right now. So the, the phase that we're in, and I kind of mentioned that in the sort of 1.x versus 2.x yeah. piece, is that we're kind of building all the components right now, giving, making the ability to, to record all these things. And then on top of that, we're going to start building more, more analysis features. So I'm excited to start working on some of those things. Um, but right now it's mainly. Uh, and, and one of the places where I mean, one of the things that brings up for me right here is um, the possibility of saying, okay, this is the seeding date, yep. and then that automatically generating a uh, harvest date or something like that. Yeah, exactly. But right now, yep. that's not possible. Something that might may come in the future is that. What you're that's saying? right. Yeah, and so that specifically is going to be. We've got a roadmap for this idea of a um, uh, succession planner or crop planner where it will actually take um, data about seed varieties yeah. and use that to auto-calculate when the harvest is expected and that kind of thing. So we're not there yet, but that's where we're headed. And this, this may be more than you want to get into, but how complicated is it to um, have it set up so that it can run it any direction you want? So what I'm asking is, like. I can choose whether or not I'm putting in the seeding date or the harvesting date, and yep. it automatically generates right. the depending on. Yeah, so that's how that's kind of what we're talking about with this with this crop planner is you you would the idea is it would be kind of like a wizard. You say like this is what I want to do, and it would either be like this is what I want to end up with, or this is what I'm starting with, and and then work forward from there. So that's kind of what we're thinking through how that will look, um, and what what would what would work best for that. So I'd love to have. Some ideas in that discussion yeah, too. That to this as well, right? What's that? Breeding and anticipated yeah, right. Well, so you can already put those logs in yourself. You can say create a harvest log in the future. Um, it's not automatic right now. Right, right. That but you could do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so there is in the new version a sale log so that you can record when a specific asset was sold. Um, also like where take yep. all that market. Yep, the customer, you can have the customer, so you can put in the market as the customer if you want in that but case. Not yet, but you're working with that. Well no, there is a there is a sale log type. Yep. Yep for that. Yep. Um, what about weather? Log yeah. Weather. Yeah, see these are all great ideas. Yeah, that's a that's a module that I'm also looking forward to working on. It's not uh, started yet, but um, the same thing with the soil test APIs, the like national oceanic um, the, the, weather, the weather agencies have these APIs that you can pull right, from, too. We have a, a weather station on our sister farm. Oh, yeah, OK. And so like, we could input that data. Yeah, before. so that would actually be a great use case for the sensor module, I think, because it's something you've already got. If you could pipe that into, your, into the sensor module so that you can, you can right, and then you have can your own. Put, and then you can start looking back on it. Yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. The nice thing about the APIs from the weather service is they already have backdated data for years and years and years, so you can kind of yeah, scroll it's back. It's all in that. your bubble. It's, to me, right. the beauty of this is like it's all there. It's your desktop. It's your yep. Mm -hmm. You know, it's specific to you. And your microclimate. All the information, yeah. like you say, it's in my handbag. It's in the bottom of the truck. Yeah, exactly. And if you're and if you're in a particular microclimate bubble too, and you have your own sensors in there, maybe it's different than what the weather service is recording. You know, oftentimes it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just to finish this demo, so you know, now I'm, I'm planning my planting. I'm going to say my seeding is going to be April 1st, and my location is going to be in the greenhouse. 
So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this in the greenhouse, but then I'm going to transplant it out uh, in, what, June, we'll say? We'll say June 1st, whatever. <laughs> you get the idea. So we'll plant this out in field A. Um, so I'm going to save that. And now, if I go and look at this planting, you can see it's got a seeding log in the future that's not done and a transplanting log in the future that's not done. Technically, both of those logs are movements because they include the location where they're going to be going in the future. But right now, the, this is not located anywhere because I haven't seeded it yet, so it's not, not there. But as soon as I come and say, yep, I seeded it, so you can click, you can click on the checkbox and then click done. Now, it says that the location is in the greenhouse and it shows the geometry of that greenhouse right there. But you don't have the market associated with that, right? So you couldn't say from this field we took this much to that market. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. So, so you're talking getting back to the sale. It's like a farmer's market kind of thing. You so, know, when, when if, if there's yeah, so you're getting like, back um, to the sale log, record, right? If there's record keeping required on, and then somebody wants to look into the quantities if that all matches up. Yeah. Yep. It yep. Would be you could, I think, so I think with the sale logs, you could get that granular if you wanted to. Yeah. The sale logs, I would say, are in beta beta. <laughs> they, uh, like I really just put them together this past um, release cycle, yeah. and it was specifically for the food safety project, because uh, yeah. because with food safety, you have to do seed to sale. You want to be able to go. Food yeah. Food. So that would kind of meet that requirement. Exactly. Yeah, it would. It, we yeah. still need, it hasn't been tested yet, so yeah. I'm not sure if I've taken everything into account in terms of use cases. Um, so we need to do some more testing. Now, that's why it's, I say it's in beta beta. It's very, still still kind of early on the sale record keeping side of things. Do you have people to test? Yeah, so we're getting, um, we're going to be working with a couple of farms specifically for the food safety uh -huh. feature. So they're going to be working with that specifically. But I'm always looking for more people who are interested in giving feedback and Trying it out. Is yeah. probably the screen that the, the seeding um, log does that have a, a source for the seeds? Yeah, great question. So um, here I'm actually going to go and undo this. So another way, you know, you might you might have done this is okay. I'm out in the field. I'm looking at this on my on my little screen. Um, now, if you look at uh, your plan. There's actually, so I, I didn't mention this late tasks before, but um, plan will show you anything that is not done in the future. Late tasks will just show anything that's not done that you were supposed to do, but it's already, that date has already passed. So because April 1st and June 1st are past, they're technically late tasks. So now I'm out in the field, I just seeded my carrots. I'll click on this log um, and I'll come in and I'll edit it. And I can enter here the source and supplier, if you want. Um, you could also snap a photo of the seed packet, if that made sense. Uh, and you can put in your quantity for how much you seeded. So this could be, you know, pounds per acre. This could be uh, five 72 plug trays. This could be um, uh, one plant or one seed. So it really, it's up to you that you, you can put in a value and the units is free form, so you can, you can use it to record however you want to. Um, I, I definitely recommend trying to standardize those things so that it's easier to compare and contrast things, but it is flexible so that you have that possibility. Yep. Um, so it's April 1st, you missed, I know my plan. Yeah. Often it's different from reality. Yeah. Sometimes my, I get confused, is it the plan or was it the actual? Yep. When you enter, do I have to manually edit the data? Uh, like let's say the date or the location if something changes from what my plan was. Yeah, so there's two ways to do it, but ultimately you're going to be trying to edit the date of the log. One way is to come into the log and edit it. Another way is if I just go back to the back to the home page, there's a little shortcut where you can click here and click reschedule. Okay. And what that'll do is it'll just give you it'll auto it'll it'll just give you a, an easier way to get to that. And you can do multiple logs in bulk that way too. So you can say, I'm doing all these today or something. Then it won't show up as late task anymore. Yeah, so I mean, I'll do that right now. It was like, oh, I screwed up. Let's yeah. I'll do that next year. Let's do an August planting instead. <laughs> so now, now if I, I just rescheduled, did I? 
Oh wait, it's, it's past August. Oh. <laughs> All right, we're gonna do it. We're doing it a September planning. Give you a plan date, though, does it? Oops. Uh, it doesn't right now, but but um, revisions is something I want to add in the future, so that you can look back and say, oh wow, I changed this log this many times. <laughs> yep. Do you have, um, in, in case of an oh shit moment, do you have easy undos if you've done some sort of mass update? Uh, that's a good question. Um, not really at the moment. Um, yeah, that would be that would be something to, to think deeper on. Yeah. Uh, I mean the. A lot more resources to do that. Yeah, I guess it would depend on the situation too, and depend on what happened. Um, yeah. Well, I mean the. Try to make it kind of hard to delete things. So I think that you know you you probably won't accidentally delete a bunch of things, but if you accidentally rescheduled a whole bunch of logs. That might be hard to hard to undo, um, but that would be something to look into for a. That would probably be a pretty useful feature to have in general. I'm just gonna think. So what about applications? Can you pull up by say compost application or you know Roundup spray where then yeah. everything shows? I yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so that would be uh, input logs you can use for that. Um, and it will show everywhere where you did whatever you did. Yeah, so I'll show that. So just to finish this, though, I, I rescheduled that to September. So now it shows up in the plan. Um, so let's just say we seeded that. <laughs> uh, you can also clone logs. So now that no longer shows up here. But if you want to look at it, you can find it under your seedings. So there it is. Um, so you asked about inputs. So in, if you wanted to add an input to something, you could say add input. Actually, I'm, let me just go back to the, the planting itself and say we, we sprayed this, these carrots. Um, so, uh, so now I'm looking at the carrot record, and you can see the breadcrumb farm assets plantings, 2017 carrots. So here's the different logs you can add for a carrot, for this carrot thing. I can say, here's a seeding, because maybe you have multiple seedings of the same planting, too, uh, or a transplanting. Um, Activities are a very general log type, so you can add, you know, I, I went out and hand weeded. That would be a good, activity is a good example of just like cultivation. Observation logs are for more passive things, like you went out and you spotted some insects, or you noted that it is going to need to be watered or irrigated. So you can create an observation and then maybe create an activity in the future to, to irrigate or something. Inputs. Uh, kind of self-explanatory, that would be anything that is being input. Um, and then harvests are things you're taking out. So we'll add an input log. You can say, um, uh, I mean, you can, yeah, let's do compost. Okay, so com you, you can just say, um, added compost. The material would just be compost. Purpose, um, fertility. Application method, uh, Broadcast one inch, maybe. Source manufacturer um, made on the farm. And the date that, that you did it. So it auto fills to today's date. If you have inputs, this kind of also came out of the food safety thing. If you have inputs that you bought, oftentimes they'll have a lot number. So you can record that here to just for traceability purposes. And a date that you actually purchased it, if you purchased it. Those are um, optional fields. Uh, and then quantity, so we'll say, uh, you know, maybe one ton total. Um, you can also say, like, I, this is, this is getting a little more advanced, maybe we don't need to go into this, but you could say, you know, I applied it to the carrots, but I only did it to this portion, maybe. So I still got to do the other other areas. But what's nice about that is then on this input log, you have a specific geometry of where this input took place. So when I save this and I'm looking at the, uh, uh, oh wait, where did that go? Huh, that should have been linked to here. Um, well, so here's the input log. Uh, so you can see the, the precise geometry that it came from. Um, that should have been linked back to the carrot, so I'll, I'll have to look at that. Too. Still in be, beta. Will that also be associated with the field, though? So if I pull the field map. That's right. Yeah. So um, 
Uh, that's actually a feature I'm working on right now is to auto associate it when you, when you choose the planting and vice versa. Uh, but you can do that manually by just coming in and saying, here's the area that it's also associated with. So now, yeah, when, I, um, when I've got it associated with that area, I can actually go and click on that one area now and scroll down and it'll show me uh, inputs and assets in that area. So St there's Steve and there's my compost that I added there. So you can do it by, um, by area too. Yep. Uh, is this backing up anywhere, or is it? Yeah, so it's all stored in a MySQL database. Um, it depends on if you're hosting yourself or if you're hosting it on Farmier. I have automatic backups on mine. Um, you'd have to set that up on yours if you're. And so, and so if you did want, to, if you did make a major error and figure it out yeah. later, you could go back to a backup if you have it set up. Yeah, that's right. Yep, yep. So that actually might be something that I'll do as part of my hosting service. Is just give you a button to like. Go, go jump back, back in time. time. It will wipe out anything that happened after that point. That's the tricky thing with undo, I think, is it can be it can be complicated to pick and choose what you're undoing. Um, but yeah, that, that would be one way to do it. Yeah. Uh, I think you had your hand up first. This is a quick question. Do you have an estimated timeline on when version 1.0 is coming out versus version 2.0? Um, you know, it's pretty organic at this point. Uh, up until this spring, I was working on this as a side project, so I just kind of started focusing most of my time on it. Um, so we'll see, we'll see. It, it, it really is like how how long it takes and you know whether or not I can support myself while I'm doing it. Um, I plan to continue working on it. Um, I hope I can continue working on it full time. So that's, but you know, the goal is too to get more people involved too, so I'm not the only one. So no, I don't, <laughs> to answer your question. Yep. Um, just curious, how, how much, uh, RAM and disk space and stuff. I looked at the Drupal yeah. site, but I don't yeah. know if this is much different from that. Yeah, I would say go by the Drupal recommendations. This is a pretty simple Drupal site, so yeah. it's not going to be. And you know, I think with with websites in general, yeah. the main thing that eats up your RAM is when you've got lots of visitors. Mm -hmm. This is private for the most part. It's only you using it, so mm -hmm. really you're you're not going to be facing those. Performance so issues. So one or two gig Linode should be fine. Oh, plenty, yeah. Plenty. Oh, okay. Yep, Good. you could do even less than that. But yeah, Linode is great. Yeah, Linode, yeah. Um, you had a question? Yeah, uh, so are, th are there currently logs for labor calculations so I can do like an enterprise crop budget at the end of the year, so much labor I put into each crop? Or uh, that's a great question. So not right now, but um, we have a feature request for um, uh, time tracking so that you could punch in and punch out on individual tasks. So you could say, go out to the field, I'm starting this uh, weeding, punch in, it records it with your user, with your particular person. Awesome. Um, and actually, the person who is, uh, you might want to look at this in the meantime, um, the Alex Smith is, is the guy who's going to be working on the mobile app. He, I met him at PASA, he has another mobile app called Beat Clock which is also open source. Um, you can download it, it costs a couple bucks to download it on the App Store, but that's specifically for time tracking. So that's something you could look at too, and maybe using the two together would be a good solution right now. The last time I saw that, it was in, only on Android. Do you know if it's still only oh. on Android? Um, I think it's on the iPhone too, but I'm not okay. sure. You should uh, look into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So did I get it right, the analytics of all this data, yep. which I love the idea of, Yeah, me too. <laughs> but then you want to see it, you want to be yeah. able to say, okay, so what did I do with my carrot planting over the last four years? Yeah. What's yep. the weather happening? Exactly. So yeah. you're saying you can export it to, at the moment you're not offering the analytics? Well, that's right. Yeah, we just haven't built those features right. yet. Yep. So do you have any recommendations? As like, what, what, I mean, I could suck it back into my Apple numbers and yeah. make a pie chart. Yep. Do you have any recommendations of where we can take the data to visualize it or um, make pie or, you know, chart? Well, I think, yeah, I think Excel would be a great place to start or open office because um, you can you can download a CSV and generate graphs off of that pretty easily. Um, if you want to link it to other data, that would just depend on where that data is coming from. Um, so yeah, it really depends on what you're doing, what, what you want to do specifically. Uh, and do you give support for stuff like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm starting to starting to think about those kind of services too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of figuring this stuff out. Yeah. yeah.
the first What was the F the time that? Beat clock. B E E T clock. That was another thing that came up. Yeah, there's yeah, there's there's a lot of we got a big list of things to do. We we just need more people to more developers to jump Have in. You thought and about having like crowd funded enhancements. Well, yeah, I've thought about that too. I mean, it's not it's not out of the question. There's only obviously there's only so much you can do. Yeah, exactly. I'm 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 not scalable. Yeah, yeah. So. open source is scalable. Individuals are not. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just checked the beat clock. It is open. Uh, it is for iPhones too. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Then maybe, maybe that was a recent development. And what if you have like an iPhone five or six? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, or we got five minutes left. Uh, we could do some more demos. I don't think there was anything specifically I had in mind. Oh, one thing I could show, which is also cool. I didn't mention this at all before, but. Um, so this is uh, this is Dorn's site. Uh, he was in the in that video at the beginning. Um, so he's got he's using a a feature that I like, which um, he has custom aerial imagery that he took. Uh, he had a he had, has a friend who I, I forget if this was done with a kite or a weather balloon, but basically just sending a camera up, taking a bunch of pictures. And then you, you use this service called uh, mapknitter.org. You just upload all your photos to this. It will, if, if the photos have metadata in them that has a GPS and sort of thing, it'll sort of automatically knit them together, but then you can also go in and stitch them to fix things. But then check it out. Now I can turn this on and off so that you can get actually like more updated maps of your farm specifically. So this is, this is like imagery that he took himself. Um, so that's that's another one of the features. Right right now we've got a map knitter module, so you can specifically use map knitter. But that's really just a simple example of like underlying that is the open layers library and open layers module, which is a totally separate, more general mapping open source library that we're leveraging to get that. So so something like that at this point when you update it, you lose the old. Or can you have? I mean, can you have the log over time? So yeah. So, um, so right now the module, the map knitter module, is pretty simple. You just tell it what map, what map you want to pull in, and you get that one map. Um, you could theoretically keep a lot of maps in mapknitter.org, and just change which one you're pointing to in your farm OS. Or we can expand that module to have multiple maps so that you can link them. But another feature that we're that I'm uh, moving towards is um, a timeline slider on your maps in general, not just for this aerial, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but for seeing the movements of things right. on the farm. So you could drag the timeline slider and see here's where my cattle grazed, or here's where the chickens were, or here's where here's the plantings that all went in <laughs> at this point of the season, kind of thing. Yeah. So being able to visualize that's an example of being able to visualize some of this stuff. So right right now the logs are laying the groundwork for that kind of thing. So we're getting the data in there, we're getting the geometries logged. It's really just a matter of coding up the time slider now to be able to display that. Um, so that's just an example of how the, you know, we've taken a long-term outlook to this, building components first, getting the ground up to get to these bit better features, bigger features. And, and you were saying earlier uh, when, when you update for example, planting date or something like that, doing the reschedule, yep. you're losing that old, but, you, but you're yep. working on being able to capture one as a plan and the other as the actual. Yeah, one. yeah. So basically that'll probably be done with what's called revisions in Drupal. So yeah. um, it'll just kind of keep track of every change you've ever made to a log. So not only the date, but also um, if you change the descriptions or upload files or something, you'll just have a log of log. A log of the log. <laughs> so it wouldn't distinguish something from a plan versus an actual. It would just, it would just be you'd have to distinguish that yourself versus which one happened. That's right. I mean, that you know, the way I'm thinking about it right now is the revisions will serve a good purpose. But yeah. if we need something more specific, that's like this is what the plan was, and this is how that differed. We could do that as well, and that would just be another layer on top. Um, probably not that uh, much more on top. 
because that would be really useful to have to say so that you could start getting a sense of well I'm not very good at planning because <laughs> I'm changing this all the time it's I'm never going by my plan or when you come to plan the following year yep you know, was this because we didn't follow the plan or was this because the plan was wrong yeah yep yep yeah that's a great idea uh, thanks Michael yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. If you want uh, updates, I've got a newsletter that I, whenever I put out a new version, I send out a, a newsletter. I um, also have some Pharma stickers I made for NOFA, so you can go stick it on your tractor or something. <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. And check out the Farm Hack Tent, too. The Cult of Cycles are out there. It's really, really cool. I've also got a little. Uh, laptop and a monitor out so if you have more questions or want to look at something just one on one feel free Good work. yeah thanks yeah, thanks sign up that's great yeah thanks for coming out i appreciate it